slide, so I'll give you a shorter version on the slide. So, I'm gonna, uh, how many people here were in the early in this morning's presentation by Raphael? So, I think I see a few people who were there. Uh, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> so, this I, I'm going to expand upon and and kind of go you know beyond where where he's talked, but there's going to be some overlap and some uh, relevance to his discussion about AMQP and Proton. And so, what I'm going to talk about today is is uh, what is AMQP, and I'll tell you what that means. You know, why is it important for large distributed enterprises and large distributed systems? And I'm going to talk about how the Apache community is uh, making it a reality, what we're doing to uh, work on it. And we can wrap up in qu with questions if we have time at the end. And here, here's uh, what I'm hoping that you'll take away from the discussion, that uh, a, a knowledge that AMQP is actually more than just messaging as we've known it, um, that AMQP is complex yet capable, um, and that's a trade-off that's important, um, that Apache makes AMQP accessible and easy to use, and of course, that the uh, Apache Software Foundation is on the cutting edge of distributed computing. I had to throw that in there. So, um, and just, just very quickly, I'll, let me introduce myself. My name is Ted Ross. Um, I'm, I work with the Red Hat. I'm out of the engineering headquarters in Westford, Massachusetts. I'm a managing principal software engineer, which means that I write code, but I also have people working for me. Um, I'm a PMC member and a committer on the Cupid project. Um, and the, we, we have a product called Merge M, which is a productized, a productized version of Cupid and a couple of other things that we um, provide commercial support for. Uh, my background is computer networking and network security. I am not a middleware guy, nor am I a messaging guy. I kind of came up the protocol stack from device drivers to TCP IP, thinking that messaging was just the next level up. Um, it really isn't that way. So uh, to uh, rehash just quickly what uh, Rafi talked about this morning, um, AMQP is, uh, stands for the Advanced Message Queuing Protocol. Um, their tagline, if you go to their website, and it's a good tagline, is Open Internet Protocol for Business Messaging. It is a protocol. And it was developed by users and vendors working together. Um, financial services uh, were the first to get started on it. That's where it was born, but other industry verticals are heavily involved in it uh, as well. And uh, primarily developed to, to address uh, lock-in from proprietary messaging systems, the fact that you know, messaging systems from different vendors don't interoperate. So um, with that said, this is the origin of AMQP really is from the message-oriented messaging oriented middleware world. Um, me meaning that uh, it was designed to deal with, um, you know, is issues in, you know, with TIBCO, IBM MQ, the, you know, kind of that middleware messaging um, industry. And as such, early versions of the protocol were based on a client and a broker. It was asymmetric, the protocol, and it, it actually defined how the broker was to operate, what the broker behavior was. Um, AMQP 1.0 is the newly ratified, spe well, it's not newly anymore, it's, but it's the ratified final specification. And uh, 1.0 dropped that asymmetry, went for a symmetric um, communication pattern, and it has become mostly silent on broker behavior. It doesn't preclude what was there before, but it doesn't require anything either, and it's not built into the protocol. Um, this this um, is actually a, a major improvement in what the er from what the early versions did. So AMQP, I'm going to claim is more than just messaging, it's more than middleware. And I'll go into that. So I, I have to jump onto this um, question. I get this question all the time when I talk or when I help other people do talks. And the question always comes up and it's something like, well, how does, you know, how does JMS compete with AMQP? Or how does this thing from, uh, this open mama from, uh, from you know, the New York Stock Exchange, is that gonna kill AMQP? And the, the answer is that these things are complementary. OpenMama and JMS are standard APIs. AMQP is a protocol. And I'm gonna hammer that home because it's important to understand. So uh, here, here's kind of a, a generic uh, architecture diagram of what it means to have a distributed application that interacts over a protocol. So the application uses an API to access a messaging system that then, you know, if, there, if there's a network involved in different systems, it has to t speak a protocol over the wire. So one classic example, uh, familiar to all, is using HTTP 
between a web server that has maybe the common gateway interface behind it as, as its, as its uh, server API and perhaps a Ruby-based REST API on the client side. Uh, likewise, we may have JMS uh, from a particular vendor that talks uh, to other applications using JMS, in which case people don't even think about the protocol, they're just thinking about um, JMS as the standard. But there is a protocol underlying it if there is going to be any communication between systems over a network. Often there's a broker involved to do queuing and uh, storing of messages in, in, intermediate, in, in between um, production and consumption. So if I have JMS vendor A, and I acquire a company that uses JMS vendor B, and we merge our systems together, there is no interoperability because the two proprietary protocols are different and incompatible and unpublished and private. So AMQP steps in to solve this problem. So AMQP provides the promise of interoperability at the messaging level where vendor A and vendor B can then share the same bus and use each other's brokers and clients. Um, and furthermore, uh, we can go beyond JMS and we can go beyond, you know, uh, uh, platform and say that I can actually interact between, you know, Java JMS and uh, Windows.net. So if I've got, uh, you know, uh, an infrastructure based on Windows and .NET and I've got an infrastructure based on Java and JMS, AMQP promises to allow these things to interact with each other um, over a common broker or a standard broker or no broker at all. Um, which is something that's available in the AMQP 1.0 specification. So since we're talking about protocols, I'll just throw up a list. This is not a complete list, but a, a list of protocols to contrast. So these are all messaging protocols, HTTP, um, very familiar, SMTP for email. Stomp is a, a, a very nice and simple messaging uh, protocol that's text-based, very easy to use, um, MQTT, uh, and others as well. So um, as, as, we dis as I discuss the protocol and what its capabilities and features are, um, sometimes I'll throw in you know, a comparison between it and other, other protocols as well. So here, here's a rundown of the anatomy of, of, um, of AMQP. It starts with a connection. It's a very fat pipe because I have to fit a lot of things into it. So, um, but a connection is basically a re reliable transport connection. So uh, AMQP uh, specifies a default port for TCP. Um, but there's no reason why it has to be TCP. In fact, the Cupid project allows also RDMA over infinite band or 10 gig Ethernet for, uh, you know, high bandwidth or low latency applications. Um, at this level, you can provide transport level security from SSL, TLS. Um, SASL is a way of plugging in various um, methods for authentication. But there's more structure now involved in this AMQP anatomy. So within this connection, I can embed multiple sessions. And when I have multiple sessions, or logical sessions, this allows me to multiplex uh, data flow over a, over a single connection. So I, if I, I may have a single TCP connection, but I may have uh, literally thousands of independent conversations flowing through that connection. Um, and AMQP allows me to do that by uh, allowing uh, the creation of, of independent sessions. And the sessions allow for interleaving of message flow. So if one session is in the process of transferring a very, very large image file, for example, and the other session is in the process of transferring uh, small alerts, uh, the alerts don't have to wait for the image file to be com completed. The protocol breaks them up into chunks and allows them to be interleaved. Next level down, uh, links. So within the sessions, we can we create links, and links are unidirectional flows of uh, of traffic, no traffic, no data flows over AMQP without there being a link. And <clears throat> links being unidirectional, but they can you can again have have thousands of links within uh, within a connection, and this allows for full duplex message transfer. So I can have messages flowing left to right, and I can have messages flowing independently right to left. Um, this is uh, in contrast, for example, to HTTP, where HTTP is a is really a half duplex protocol where it's always request response. Um, this allows servers to send information uh, unsolicited to clients if that's what your application demands. Um, asynchronous message transfer uh, means that you can ratchet up the performance because messages flow and their acknowledgments uh, flow back uh, asynchronously. And flow control is handled at the link level so I can have independent flow control. One of those links may be backed up and congested and slowed down or maybe even stopped 
where other links over the same connection can be flowing freely. Each, each one has its own uh, notion of flow control. So let's forget about the connections and the sessions. Let's focus on the link. And, and again, I'll reiterate that the link is um, unidirectional and it is used to transfer messages or deliveries from a source node to a destination node. So I've got a source node on the right. Um, it's got a message sitting on it wanting to be delivered to the destination node on the left. So the, this, this uh, message can be transferred in actually one of two different modes. It can be copied, like the top one, where the message is transferred to the destination, but it remains on the source. Or it can be moved, like the lower one, where the message is actually transferred and its uh, ownership is moved from right to left in this case. So if you look at the source node in the copy case, um, when I say node, I'm, I don't mean queue, I don't mean anything in particular, even topic. That could be a file, it could be a database, it could be you know, some sort of live sensor that's providing data. Um, in, in fact, uh, that link um, can, uh, on, its, you know, on its ingress side here, the, the source side of the link may even have a filter associated with it uh, that's like a query. So you could actually implement a database query using an AMQP link by attaching it, saying here's what my cr criteria is, my filter, and the source node would then send uh, and transfer information across according to that criteria. So um, as messages are transferred, they are potentially settled. There's a number of different ways or different qualities of service, service if you will, uh, as to how messages are transferred. So all the way from kind of the, the very uh, best effort, fire and forget, where I, as a source node, pre-settle the message and I don't care whether it gets to the destination. And if it doesn't get there, I don't want to know about it. I'm going to just do my best to get the message to the destination. Or I can go the next level up where I wish to find out what its disposition is at the other side. Was it accepted? Um, or was it rejected? Or was it released? And uh, rejected means that the receiver decided that the message was evil and uh, not, not, uh, not to be sent anywhere else and it should be dropped. Um, released means that the destination thought the message was okay but didn't have uh, time or inclination to deal with it and wants it to be uh, resent to somebody else from the source node at a later time. Um, as we go up the level of complexity of this, of this quality of service, we have the notion of transactions, where a local transaction from source to destination is when I have a certain number of messages that either must all be delivered or must none be delivered. So 25 messages, or two messages in this case, uh, get them both there or get none of them there. And uh, if they don't all arrive, then we'll roll back the transaction and none of the messages will have been transferred. A distributed transaction is where I've got some third party in the mix. So for example, if my destination node is interacting with a database, these two messages arrive in a transaction, and I'm then going to do two uh, SQL inserts into my database on a different transaction in the database, I want to make sure that those messages go into the database. If the database rejects or fails, or if that transaction rolls back, I can then also roll back the transfer so that the messages wind up back on the source and it's as though nothing happened or, or, there, or the entire distributed transaction is completed. Um, another, another aspect that I, I referenced uh, before when talking about links is the notion of flow control where the destination can issue credit. So the destination can actually place a limit on how many messages are going to be received or how much space it has um, available to store received messages. So in this case, I've got three slots and one message has been received. And the remaining credit on the source is two. That means the source is not going to send me any more than two more messages because I don't want to have any more than three messages sitting on the left-hand side. Flow control is independent from settlement or acknowledgement of messages. So here, here's a use case that I've seen in the wild in a number of different cases. Um, and it's actually a fairly common and interesting uh, use case for a large distributed system. I've got a data collection system that is collecting data from a multitude of data sources, perhaps hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions of data sources, um, all of which uh, come in at the time of their own choosing to uh, send me the information that they collected. And so, so what that means is that these data sources are going to make a connection to my collection system and drop, drop the data there for storage and for analysis or for whatever uh, purpose it serves. 
Um, the problem is that if you do this with one of the simpler protocols, so you might say to yourself, well, HTTP is a nice simple protocol or Stomp's a nice simple protocol for trans transmitting data. But if, if I've got a collection server that's going to um, get 100,000 dumps of data all at the same time, I've got a bit of a system problem. I'm going to have to either, um, I'm going to have to either over provision that system, make it very, very big and make it very, very uh, memory, you know, have a lot of memory in it to handle that burst of data, or I'm going to have to build something in my application in order to, I'm going to have to build something around that protocol, do something unnatural maybe with HTTP in order to make it not overflow me because, um, you know, HTTP and Stomp are going to rely on the TCP, uh, the underlying TCP back pressure, and that's not going to provide back pressure until you've sent quite a lot of data. So I'm going to need a lot of memory in order to handle it. Uh, with AMQP links, that data collection system can accept the connections but issue no credit and only issue credit in a rolling fashion across those links as it, uh, as it has memory to process the data. So it, it can provide for a very easy, you know, even though it's a more complicated protocol and a, and a more sophisticated protocol, it can actually provide for a more simple overall system design uh, because I don't need to over-engineer to handle bursts of traffic. I've got uh, built-in capability to handle that. So to summarize uh, the benefits, and I, I guess I would call this kind of the large enterprise benefits of AMQP. Um, it provides session multiplexing. It provides uh, full dupl duplex asynchronous transfer, uh, independent threads of transfer. Um, it provides uh, formal semantics of message handoff, including transactions. It's very deliberate about who owns the message at any given time. Uh, provides data security, uh, both at the connection level and it can provide data security at the end-to-end -end level. It provides flow control. Um, it provides serialization of structured data, which is something I didn't go into detail on, but th that uh, Rafi spoke about earlier. And uh, the ability to attach message metadata um, to uh, traffic as it's sent across. So I'm going to talk, I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk a little bit about uh, topologies. So, uh, again, if you're a messaging person, you understand the typical uh, me the MOM topology, where I've got endpoints, in this case speaking a protocol called AMQP, and they are interacting through an intermediary broker, and the broker is storing and forwarding messages according to, um, you know, whether it's queues, whether it's topics, whether it's, you know, some sort of routing algorithm, uh, the, but there's the intermediary in the middle that is brokering the transfer of messages. Um, I have in AMQP the option of dropping that intermediary and going straight point to point. Um, you could almost think of this as uh, using AMQP as a drop-in replacement for a different protocol, like maybe HTTP. Uh, presumably one of these endpoints would act as a server and accept incoming connections. The other endpoint would act as a client and initiate outgoing connections. But in both cases, in, in this case, the transfer between the endpoints is um, according to the rules of AMQP and, and uh, gets the benefits of that protocol. There is a third and very interesting topology that I want to talk more about, and that is uh, not having an inter intermediary broker, but having an intermediary network or a messaging service. Again, talking AMQP as the, as the uh, protocol in order to reach this. So as far as the endpoints are concerned, they might think they're talking to a broker. They might even think they're talking point to point, but there's in fact um, a, a network of intermediaries in between the, in, in between and forwarding messages back and forth. And it, I want this network to be scalable to a very large size and I want it to perform well. So what might be inside of that network? There, there might be different kinds of things. It's not just messaging brokers, but I may have arrays of proxies, for example, that are fronting this, this cloud. I may have uh, a mesh of routers inside of it that are providing redundant paths in case, um, you know, in case I have requirements for high availability. I don't want to use clustering for higher availability because it's really a network, it's not a broker. So I, I, I might do better um, getting availability by providing a, a redundant um, network topology or a mesh that can find alternate paths if they are needed. I might have brokers in this, um, in this cloud as well that are providing the more classic store and forward queuing, you know, offloading some of those applications. There might be uh, application functions, there might be transformation or filtering going on. 
Um, over on the left, I've got a box with a question mark on it because I, I think that when we dig into this and as we look into this possibility of building these uh, networks at the AMQP level, uh, possibilities fall out. And, and I'm, ho I'm hoping that we find uh, developers who are interested in building new types of things that will enhance uh, these networks and provide greater uh, capabilities to them. So if I look into what an AMQP router might be, uh, again, using, using the nodes and the links uh, picture, um, I've got links to connected endpoints, and I've got a routing table, and I've got links to other routers. So my router node will then track uh, locally connected endpoints, find out who's connected, uh, who is interested in receiving information from what addresses, and and it has links to other routers so that it can share this information and uh, you know, build, a, build a smart network. So if I'm back in my network uh, of uh, routers, um, there's actually quite a bit of technology. In fact, the internet has been doing this very well for many decades. Uh, the internet is very good at uh, taking a message that was dropped into it in New York City and popping it back out in uh, its destination in Hong Kong or London. And uh, it doesn't really you know, if, if there are failures along the way, it'll, it'll heal itself automatically. So there's a lot of these technologies that are available. Uh, I propose that we can use them to good, uh, to, to a good effect uh, in this world as well, where I can build a router network that uh, is easy to configure, easy to expand upon, and uh, can automatically handle um, the, fail the loss of link or the loss of, um, of components. So that's what a router node uh, would be participating in. A proxy node, on the other hand, is something very simple where um, the, the fact that AMQP uses links as the way of transferring all information or all, all transferring all messages, uh, I can actually tie these links together in a proxy. Um, so let's say, for example, the left-hand link is public-facing. Um, it goes outside of the cloud to endpoints that wish to use this messaging service, and the inward link is uh, the right-hand link is inward-facing and perhaps goes to a, a broker for queuing or uh, subscribing to queued messages. So I can actually do uh, fairly sophisticated policy enforcement at link setup time if I wish. I can say, you know, based on your identity as you authenticated, what are you allowed to subscribe to? What are you allowed to send to? Um, if you are allowed to do what you're asking to do, then we can connect these links together. Um, the delivery of the transfers is very simple. So, so you know, messages flowing from one to the other is, uh, is very simple and can be done in a very performant way in code uh, because I don't need to look at every single message and say, what are they trying to do? What are they, what are they trying to do? They declared their intention when they set up the links in the first place. Um, renaming may occur. So, uh, if I wish to have a uh, multi-tenant type of environment where my left-hand link is coming in, he's identified himself uh, as a certain identity, and he is then known to have access to, you know, uh, maybe a very s limited number of queues or resources in this network. And he may have his own namespace that uh, is specific to him. And that, that this proxy node can then map from the user's namespace to a global internal namespace in order to provide you know, limited visibility based on who your identity is. So there's an interesting use case that kind of comes out of this, which, which, is the, which I'll sort of focus on. There's many use cases, but one I'll focus on is um, using AMQP as a way of providing um, public service delivery. Um, we, we at Red Hat have, have a number of customers that do things like this where they're, you know, for example, a, uh, um, a European financial services company that has partners and customers that, use, that actually uh, use AMQP as their way of delivering um, information, uh, uh, market information, and taking control and request information over, over the uh, internet or over uh, private networks. And what's required in order to do this is hardened proxies. We need to enforce access policy. Uh, a messaging broker isn't necessarily the best place to do this, but a proxy could be uh, placed in between the client and the broker, and it could be a very good place to enforce um, access policy. It provides multi-tenancy, like I mentioned. Um, it can resist denial of service. I, I don't really want to say denial of service attacks, but um, because a lot of denial of service is non-malicious. It's just because somebody screwed up the implementation of their client, and it opened 
10 million links to the same queue. So uh, a, a proxy is a very good place to focus uh, on, on provi providing protection against such things. And again, you know, routers, another type of intermediary, provide redundancy, they provide scaling, uh, they provide um, high availability and resiliency to failure. And brokers, as we know them and love them now, provide queuing, persistence, and uh, transformation, lots of things that they can, uh, they can do well. So AMQP is complicated. Uh, it, it's it's a, a trade-off between you know, complexity and um, and capability. It's complex compared to, say, HTTP because you can write an HTTP server in Python probably in, you know, less than an hour and you can get something that works because it's a simple protocol. Uh, AMQP has got a lot of stuff that has to go on. You've got to do the establishment of the connections, the, the establishment of the sessions, establishments of links. You know, what's a good way to use it? So here's where uh, projects within the Apache Software Foundation step in. So if, I, if I'm using already using messaging systems, well, I can look at Apache ActiveMQ. Uh, Hiram over here is going to be giving a talk after me. He's not talking specifically about AMQP, but he is talking about the future of ActiveMQ. ActiveMQ is a multi-protocol uh, Java message broker. It's very popular, and it now includes an AMQP transport as one of the protocols that it supports. This is one way uh, to utilize uh, AMQP. Apache Cupid is a, is a more AMQP-centric project it provides a pair of brokers, a native one written in C++ and a, and a Java one. Um, the native one is, is quite performant and uh, ha, you know, has, some, has some unique capabilities in terms of performance and latency. Uh, Cupid provides an array of clients for different, um, for different platforms, you know, native Linux, native Windows, uh, Java JMS or JCA, and the .NET environment on Windows or elsewhere. Um, it, provides clients in various langu languages as well, including C, Java, Python, a number of uh, different scripting languages, and you know, the various .NET programming languages. So this is good if you're using messaging and you wish to utilize AMQP, but what if you are somebody who wants to incorporate AMQP into your application or into your API, or better yet, what if you're somebody who wants to develop some of these intermediary capabilities to uh, solve some, some interesting problems? Uh, first of all, if you were in that latter category of people, I would actually be very interested in talking to you because um, you know, there's a lot of interesting things going on. And I should mention also that I'll be around all week if anybody wants to, uh, uh, to discuss any of these things or uh, see any of the things that we've talked about in more detail or in terms of uh, demonstration. So AMQP in your systems, well, uh, Rafi talked this morning about Cupid Proton. It's a sub-project of Cupid. It is intended for embedding and integration. It's, uh, it's agnostic about threading models and programming models. It's written in, um, actually, there's three different implementations, C, Java, and uh, JavaScript is planned. The thought being that with those three programming languages, there's nowhere it can't, it can't go. Um, you know, C is, is great for embedded systems. It's great for uh, you know, backing up uh, scripting languages like Perl and Python. Uh, Java is, of course, critical for the JVM, uh, pure JVM environments. JavaScript is critical for being inside the broker and being inside Node.js. Um, we, we believe that covers the bases. And then Proton also provides a messenger API that has a bunch of script language uh, wrappers as well. And uh, Rafi spoke about that this morning. There's a second project that I'll, I'll mention. Uh, this one's much younger. It's uh, called Cupid Dispatch, and it is um, an event-driven multi-threaded container for Proton. It's a little bit, got, it's got a different focus, and I'll speak about that in a moment. So keep it Proton. Uh, as Rafi said before, it's, it's got two components, uh, primarily a, pr a protocol engine, pure state machine, non-blocking API, no threads, no locks, no mutual exclusion, no, uh, no, none of those issues. It's very uh, uh, simple to use and can be portable to a lot of different environments. And a separate driver, which provides the I.O. and defines the threading model. So if your I.O. is based on you know, uh, green threads or if it's based on poll or select or if it's based on um, you know, lib event, uh, you, you, you can you, a driver can be provided for any one of those environments that provides you know, thread control. And it is separate so that it can be replaced. Uh, and, and 
in, for the purpose of going into different environments. And again, the messenger API that is built on top of the engine and driver is an easy to use messaging API for developers. It hides many of the, of the sort of details underneath uh, uh, for, uh, of AMQP. So, you know, a hello world written against messenger it can be done in just a couple of lines of code. And furthermore, you know, real programs can be written on, on top of messenger. It's a useful interface. So this is a way to integrate. So if, I, if you've got an application or if you've got your own messaging API, perhaps you have a bridge that goes, that's going from uh, AMQP to a different protocol, um, you have the option of integrating this over the messenger API. Uh, William in the back corner did this with the, uh, with the um, Open Mama API for, from uh, New York Stock Exchange as an example. Okay, well sometimes you need more control. Okay, this is, this is what uh, we refer uh, sometimes to as the red pill. So I can build my application right over the engine and driver interface. This is the red pill because if you really want to know, you take this pill. <laughs> because you need to know how it really works. And this, this exposes you to, you know, to the underbelly and to all the bells and whistles and all the capabilities. Uh, when you need control over every aspect of AMQP, this is, this is an option that you have. It is significantly more complex. In fact, writing the hello world in this environment uh, is considerably larger than the, the couple of lines of code that Rafi showed you before. So this is where the Cupid Dispatch project comes in. This is a brand new project, something I've been working on myself. Um, and it, its, goal, its goals are to aid integration for those cases, those one percenters out there who uh, need to use the engine directly, um, would look at this as a possible uh, way to integrate. Um, it provides a framework for development of AMQP infrastructure. It's aimed at infrastructure, in fact, uh, the project was not created for the perp as, as a project. Um, I, I was working on, what I'm trying to do is solve problems related to inter intermediaries. I, I need a router and I need a proxy because I'm trying to solve some real world problems in, in the distributed computing world. And it turns out that in order to do this, there's quite a bit of common work that fell out and, and it turned into a project of its own which is, which is uh, now a sub-project within Cupid. It's called Dispatch, and it provides a bunch of hooks and capabilities and APIs that make it easier to use this interface. Um, the other goal I want to mention, and this is very important, is that, that uh, I want to be able to build simple AMQP intermediaries that, that can fully utilize the investments that people have made in networking infrastructure. So you know, if, if, if I've got a customer or a prospect that has invested in 10 gigabit ethernet, or InfiniBand, or some sort of very, very high performance networking infrastructure, you know, I, I want to be able to utilize it. I want to be able to send AMQP messages over that at line rate. So, um, so it, uh, performance is a major emphasis. I believe that if we can build a network or of intermediaries, that cloud I showed you, that AMQP cloud, if it can perform at line rate on modern networks, then there are a lot of very, very interesting things that it can do and very, very interesting ways that it can change the way that uh, distributed applications are developed. It is multi-threaded and it's an event-driven uh, container environment. So it works, um, it, it allows you to use Proton Engine in a multi-threaded environment and it's primarily asynchronous and event-driven. Okay, Here, here's, a, here's a, its basic architecture. So the bottom two boxes are familiar because that's stock Proton. And there are a number of boxes layered on top of it in, in a tiered fashion. So, um, and, and each, each one of these boxes provides an API for a different purpose. There's the server, there's container, there's a router, and there's message. So the server API is all about managing connections. Uh, one of the things that you need to do when you build a network of components is you need to be able to interconnect them. So they need to be able to accept inbound connections, listeners. But they also need to be able to make outbound connections, uh, connectors to other, other entities or other intermediaries. And the reason I call them resilient is because if they can't be made, if that, if that destination is not reachable, I want that connection to retry periodically. And if the connection is lost, I want it to be reconnected. Um, the, the server layer provides uh, resilient connector capability. 
And it provides a couple other nice hooks like, you know, timers um, that you can use for doing periodic maintenance or whatever it is that you need to do. It provides thread control so I can quiesce my server threads or resume them. Uh, that's, that's useful if I want to do reconfiguration. Um, it provides management of file descriptors that are not related to AMQP. So if I'm building a bridge between AMQP and another protocol, um, I might wish to take the file descriptors that represent that other protocol's connections and manage them all together. Uh, it allows me to do that. It provides uh, um, an API for handling of, of operating system signals, things like that. Um, up a level, the container API is all about creating AMQP nodes. So it, it, uh, it manages the node lifecycle. And it allows me to write code that deals with links. So a link attach, detach. You know, what do I do when a new link comes in? What do I do when a link goes away? Um, delivery of uh, messages inbound and outbound. Um, it deals with the changes in disposition and settlement. So when, when I send a message to, uh, to a peer, that, mess that, that peer has the option of settling the message or acknowledging it or rejecting it. Um, th those hooks are provided here. Um, this is also where you pr participate in AMQP's flow control at the link level. I'm going to step up another, another layer. Actually, I'm, I'm going to talk about the message, um, the, the message module, the message API. This is a way of dealing with the contents of a delivery. The AMQP specification is nicely layered. It's actually well architected. Chapter two is all about the way de deliver data is delivered. A chapter three is all about what the data format itself looks like and what the message structure is. So container is a chapter two container, ch ch chapter two, and message is all about chapter three. It deals with the contents of message, of, of the message deliveries themselves. Um, it's optimized for high performance intermediaries. It has, um, it uses fixed buffer, uh, fixed, fixed size buffers and chains of buffers in order to e you know, ease in uh, memory management uh, to reduce the fragmentation of memory when you're dealing with lots of um, transfers going back and forth. Um, it provides access to fields within the message where you don't have to worry about uh, where buffer boundaries are. In fact, I've got a test in, in the uh, system where I have buffers of one byte. So it's, it's not optimal, but uh, if you can pass that test, then you're doing buffer management correctly. Um, it also parses message contents only as far as needed. So back in, the, in, in that uh, example I showed of the proxy, where I'm just taking two links and transferring messages from one to the other, if, if I only care about the link addresses, then I don't really need to look very deeply into the messages at all. And this gives me the option of um, transferring messages from one link to the other without wasting the bandwidth or the process, you know, the processing to, uh, to parse that message. I can treat it as uh, pretty much a uh, black box of, of content. Um, it efficiently handles modified annotations. AMQP allows intermediaries to annotate messages as they go through, for example, for the purpose of trace. If I want to trace the path of a message through a network, then every, every uh, hop along that network is going to put a little tag on that message in order to say that it visited here. Uh, that needs to be efficiently handled. Uh, the last component that is in here is the router component. And this is exactly the same thing I presented before when I showed the node and link diagram of the router. It, trinks, it, it tracks consumers by address so that messages can be routed to it. It has a routing table. It forwards messages you know, from inbound to the appropriate outbound links. Um, it supports internal and external endpoints. Uh, internal meaning that I can actually sync messages and source messages internally. Uh, that's useful for things like management agents, um, generating events, et cetera. And it has the protocol support to interact with other routers in a network. Future work, um, uh, support for configuration. Um, the very next thing I want to work on is the uh, agent for remote management. This is uh, getting back to the, uh, Theo's talk this morning where he said that he was a strong believer in instrumentation. I'm also a strong believer in instrumentation, being able to remotely access my container and see what's inside of it and, uh, and perhaps control what it's doing. Uh, proxy node is, is future work as well. So Cupid Dispatch is a project. It, it's a sub-project of Apache Cupid. It right now lives in a directory called uh, extras if you're going to the subversion. The reason I'm telling you about a subversion is because it has not yet been released. 
So if you want to look at it, that's where you would find it. Its installed artifacts um, include development support, a set of header files for the APIs, and a shared object library for, um, you know, for building applications on top of it. And it also comes with a router a executable, which is just a, a, a raw message router that you can um, use as well. Uh, the website content will appear uh, coincident with the release of Cupid 022, which is scheduled for the end of next month. So just to summarize the projects that are involved in the MQP at Apache and what their status is. So Apache ActiveMQ is at version 5.8. It's very mature. Um, Apache Cupid is at version 020. And despite its, its uh, rev number, it is also very mature. Um, both uh, ActiveMQ and, Cup and Cupid are deployed in, um, in mission critical systems across the world. Uh, Cupid Proton released 0 0.4 yesterday. It's, it, it is an emerging project. It's, uh, it's getting uh, an increasing community of users and developers, and it's gaining momentum uh, in, in the Apache community. Uh, Cupid Dispatch is unreleased, and it's brand new, and I'm talking about it for the first time here. So I had a slide at the very beginning that was what I hoped you would take away from the discussion. Here, I repeated the slide. Maybe we can see how well I did. Um, you know, AMQP, I believe, goes beyond messaging. Uh, I see AMQP as being perhaps a, a good way to take the worlds of networking and the worlds of messaging and, and combine some of their, uh, some of their advantages. You know, internet networking is very, very good at building huge, huge distributed systems that are very reliable. Messaging is very, very good at making it, very, very, making it easy to uh, develop applications quickly that are distributed. A combination of the two would be very compelling. AMQP is complex, yet capable um, and appropriate for certain, uh, for certain use cases. Apache projects make it accessible in various different ways. Questions and discussion. Anything, uh, any questions anybody has? The gentleman in the back. So the question is, um, in these projects, who, who would use these different projects? Uh, so ActiveMQ is, is a uh, native Java messaging broker. It's very appropriate for Java environments, but it's also appropriate as a standalone broker. Hiram will correct me if I'm wrong. He's speaking about it next hour. Um, I would say ActiveMQ is, is um, a very, uh, it's a very mature messaging broker that's got a lot of capabilities that are, um, that are very commonly used in traditional mom environments. I would say Apache Cupid is less, uh, less uh, typical in terms of what its capabilities are for uh, middleware-oriented messaging, but Apache Cupid is, is used in very, uh, very frequently in cases where performance is an issue. It can, uh, be, t it can be tuned to go very, very fast in certain use cases. Um, Cupid Proton is, again, you know, uh, for, for people who want to, I think there's two audiences here. There's the, there's the messenger audience that wants to be able to use AMQP 1.0 in its raw form, perhaps even in point-to-point -point environments, but it's also for people who want to, to uh, integrate AMQP into their own environments, their own applications. Uh, dispatch is the extreme case of that ladder. So for um, people who want to build infrastructure, I think, around AMQP itself. There was a question up front. I'm sorry, you're talking about other than financial? Other than financial, yes. Well, who would use this? For what kind of systems? Oh, well, um, there's quite a, quite a few different systems. I mean, there's um, the, the transportation and logistics is, is uh, using this to good effect. They, they've built, built very large networks uh, based on AMQP. Uh, in order to, in fact, in, even in order to deal with mobility. Now, when I say mobility, I'm not talking about handheld devices. I'm talking about, you know, devices that move and uh, attach into the network for a different, you know, they roam in the network. They may be, you know, associated with aircraft or uh, railroads, for example, or, you know, trains. Um, the, um, th there are a number of different 
um, verticals that that uh, are interested. Uh, even even um, companies that are just a lot a lot of customers that I deal with are with large enterprises in various verticals, but they're the part, they're the team within the company that's responsible for, for providing messaging services to developers within the company. So in a lot of cases, you know, we're trying to build out large scale environments, whether point of sale um, for for retail, uh, whether it be financial. But for those kind of systems, because mm -hmm. the device, you know, the footprint to run this mm -hmm. kind of message, uh, mm -hmm. either broker, or router, mm -hmm. or in you know, a client application, need a huge uh, footprint to run this, right? No, not at all. In fact, the the, the uh, Proton Messenger footprint is. Do you, Griffey, do you know what the footprint is? It's very small. It's, it's small. Yeah. It, it's very small. It's, it's it's native. It has almost no dependencies. Le less than megabytes. Yeah. Yeah. Ten, ten, I would say tens of kilobytes uh, if you if you want to really make it small. And of course, if it's storing messages, that the, 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 uh, it doesn't have to be Linux. It runs on. It, it should run in any environment. Uh, the, the the implementation of Proton is pure C, with very few dependencies. So it's meant to be portable to. Uh, to lots of places and handheld devices is you know very of great interest to us. Right. So the handheld would be uh, categorized to use this. Yes, yes. And handheld might you know might be Java, might be C, depending on yeah, what the operating system. Even the scanners. Mm -hmm. so. Yes, exactly. Yes, uh, yes, definitely scanners. Those you know, if, not in America, but in other countries where they you know where they have the the um, the uh, credit card scanners that are portable. That, that kind of environment is very interesting. Yep, question from the back. Um, the flow control credit system, is mm -hmm. that like an advertising or is that for like a, like a cable company that has two peers and one's trying to send something to the other? Mm -hmm. what, is it, what is the information of what credits are available to go from the target back to the... When, when, a, when a link is established, the downstream node of that link has to issue credit to the upstream before any messages can be transferred. And there's actually a, there's actually a uh, uh, an exchange that occurs that says I, I I now grant you n n credits. And then the target replenishes its credits. Basically. Yes, 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 and it, it can do it can replenish them. The, the idea of of credit assignment is that you you want you want to assign if you if you're bandwidth sensitive you want to make sure that you have enough credits to avoid pipe, pipeline stalling so that that you're always sending as fast as you can and credit replenishments are coming back. So if you have a high latency link, you need more credits. And if you have a, uh, or if you have a memory sensitive on a receiver with lots of links, you might have fewer credits, but you're going to have pipeline stalling. Ricky. Just to add on, uh, add on to that, there's actually the, the flow control information goes in both directions. So a yes. sender that has messages sitting there waiting can actually send uh, an information to the receiver saying, hey, I have this many messages. Yep. Right. It's called an offer. It's, it's, it's the opposite of credit. And it's a, so if you have many connections coming in and you're not sure who to give credit to, the offer protocol can say, you know, I, I, I can, I, I'll give credit where there are messages available to be sent. Yep. Yeah. It's very cool. Yeah. So the question is, is comparison between MQP and MQTT. There, um, I do have information about that, and speak to me afterwards. Uh, I think. I'll take up your slide on that. Thanks. Will you? Okay. Yeah. And he he actually implements both, and there was actually a very good imp, uh, comparison paper written. I'm just not sure if it's public. So if it is, I'll I'll point you to it. Anything else? Thank you very much.